This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I'm Ariana Parks, physical therapist and your host, and today I interview Dr. Rodrigo Scatoni da Silva to talk about the importance of kinetic chain factors in the management of tendinopathy. Dr. Scatoni Silva is an associate professor in the physical therapy program at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil. He completed his postdoc in biomechanics and movement science at the University of Delaware and is a specialist in sports physiotherapy. He also serves as an associate editor of the Brazilian Journal of Physical Therapy and is the leader of the Brazilian Tendinopathy and Sports Injury Research Group. In our discussion today, you are going to learn about how factors like hip muscle weakness, dorsiflexion restriction, and trunk position during jump landings can interfere with forces on the patellar tendon. We also talked about how lower extremity and trunk weakness can favor the development of tendinopathies in the upper extremities. So if you find this information valuable, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel, click on the notification bell to stay updated, give us a thumbs up and share with other clinicians if you might benefit from this conversation. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the do anything, anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Hi, Rodrigo. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm doing well, Mariana. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I'm happy to have a Brazilian here with me today um, to talk about tendinopathy. So I know you have a lot of publications and it's your area, your field of um, expertise. So let's just start talking a little bit about yourself, your career, your background for the ones that don't know you. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a Brazilian physical therapist. Uh, I was born and raised here. I've been a physical therapist for almost 15 years now. Um, I am specialized in sports physical therapy and uh, I'm currently an assistant professor at a university in the northeast coast of Brazil, UFRN. I've been uh, teaching here for seven years, doing research as well. Uh, I was fortunate to learn from some of the best people in the world that do research with tendinopathy. So during my PhD, uh, which I earned in Sao Paulo in the southeast of Brazil, I was able to go to Australia for almost a year. I was at the Australian Institute of Sport with uh, Professor Jamie Gaida and Professor Craig Purden. Uh, Professor Purden is uh, a legend of tendinopathy. He's been doing research with Professor Joe Cook for almost 20 years. I think more than that. He was involved in five Olympic Games. He's such a legend. He knows so much about treating patients with tendinopathy. So I was very fortunate to learn from him. And uh, more recently, I went to the U.S. I did a postdoc with Professor Karin Subernagel, which is also a world-renowned uh clinician and researcher that worked with Achilles tendinopathy, Achilles tendon ruptures. So yeah, I was, I was fortunate to learn from some of the best. And uh, currently I am the leader of a research group here in Brazil. I supervise a master's degree and PhD students. And uh, our main focus is tendinopathy, but we work with several sports injuries. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my experience with your audience. That's awesome. A lot of experience and great things that you, um, you're you able to do and, and learn from these amazing people. So super cool. Um, and let's start talking about the kinetic chain factors that I know that's a big part of your research. So what is the importance of this, uh, the kinetic, kinetic chain factors in the management of tendinopathies? Uh, sure. So, um, well, just, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, when I was starting to study this over 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, we were looking into the literature and most treatments for 
for tendinopathy were uh, progressive loading programs that uh, the eccentric training was the uh, most popular one. And uh, that was that was good. That was helpful. But uh, I, I feel I felt like something was missing because we were looking into a lot of patients. We were assessing them and we were seeing that they had several aspects uh, that were weak or weren't moving really well. And uh, the landing mechanics was was some some off. It was it wasn't it wasn't great. So we were starting to wonder whether those factors would be relevant, especially when they were returned to sport, because it's an overused condition. So the progressive loading is the, the uh, most important treatment to get their tendon back to becoming functional again. But unless we address the factors that caused the overload in the first place, when they go back to sport, they have a, a very high chance of having a, a recurrence, having pain again. So we started looking into a more broad assessment of those patients. And uh, based on the clinical uh, uh, expertise that I had, I started to collect what I thought was most important. I started to look into the literature to, to see what was already done in the in that area. And there, there was very little research on that, on that field. So we started researching the importance of the hip, the ankle, and in knee injuries, uh, how the trunk position influences the, the forces in the knee. And we started seeing some really important, some really relevant things. And uh, if you think about uh, how our body works when you when you're landing from a jump, you have a whole kinetic chain that has to dissipate the load. So if, you, if your body hits the ground, the body, the, the ground hits your body back, you have the ground reaction force, as we call it in biomechanics. And your body has to deal with that force. So you have three major uh, joints to dissipate that load. You have the hip, you have the hip extensors working, you have the knee extensors working, and you have the ankle plantar flexors working eccentrically to dissipate that load and if one of those muscle groups is not working well you have the other muscle groups having to do more to dissipate that load so we started looking into that and uh seeing how that would affect uh, the patients and how that would affect treatment outcomes for patients with tendinopathy so just to uh give a short answer to your question i think it's very important because if you look into how the body works, how uh, it works when we're doing functional activities, sports activities. We use the whole body to perform the sports movement, to perform the functional activity. And if one of the link of the chain is not working well, the remainder uh, aspects will have to compensate. And that's when injuries occur. So that's what, why we give so much emphasis in assessing and addressing these factors in these patients. Yes, I think it makes completely sense because nothing works isolated in the body, right? Everything is connected. So um, I know that you done a, a study comparing the heavy slow resistance training with the um, the kinetic chain. Uh, I don't know how you call it the kinetic chain training. I don't know exactly the how you how you call it. Don't remember on that paper, but. Because I feel like the, the the slow resistance, you are there doing very isolated things. You are contracting, eccentric, concentric, working specific on that tandem. But on, on that case, on your study, I saw that you did uh, some work on the hip, on the ankle, and uh, the landing and all of that that you just talked about. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about each individual factor and how that impacts on the, on the tendinopathy. So let's start talking about the hip muscle strength. So how do you feel like the strength, the hip muscle strength interfere with the patellar and Achilles, Achilles tendinopathies as well? Sure. Uh, so like I said, you, you, your body works, uh, integrated you have a, an, an intern connection between the joints and, and the force needs to be dissipated by the whole body so uh we started looking into that in my phd studies in 2012 2011 something like that and uh we were set, assessing the hip muscles the knee muscles and the ankle muscles as well as the landing mechanics in people with and without patellar tendinopathy and what we found was that the people with patellar tendinopathy had an abnormal landing mechanics. They would land with a, a more stiff mechanics. They, they didn't use their joints well to dissipate the load. They had less movement in relation to the controls. They moved their trunk less. They moved their knee less. Uh, 
So we, we started wondering what would happen if we change that. And the hip plays a major role in that aspect because these people with pain, they had 27% less hip extensor at strength in relation to the controls. So as soon as we saw that, we thought, oh, that's, that's, there, there's no way that that's not relevant because even if that wasn't the cause of the problem, if they have weakness in their hips, that may be one of the reasons why their pain is persistent because they are having to use the knee more to dissipate the load. They may have to be to use their ankles more to dissipate the load. So we started looking into strengthening the hips, changing the landing mechanics, thinking about distributing better the loads between the different joints so that we wouldn't have overload in one specific joint. But uh, after the study that, that we published this study in 2016 in the Physical Therapy and Sport Journal, uh, and uh, we actually presented these results at the University of Oxford in 2014. We, we won an award for that, uh, for that uh, study that we did. That's something I'm very proud of. And uh, we started to, doing, uh, to thinking about interventions that would also address these factors to actually give the patients uh, uh, a greater chance of having long-term results. After we did that study, there was a, a study from a Chinese group that also found that the people with patellar tendinopathy have around 20% less uh, strength in the hip abductors and in the hip external rotators in relation to the healthy controls. And they also found a significant correlation between decreased strength in the hip muscles and worse function, worse symptom severity. So uh, if you take those results into consideration, you have that if people have less strength in the hip muscles, they are going to have a poor outcome in their in their function. Their their uh, symptoms are, is gonna are gonna be worse. So, looking into the hips is one link of the chain. It's important. I I just want people to be careful of not thinking it's the most important thing because people tend to be super excited when they find out find out a new factor and they completely disregard the rest that they know. So the hips are important, the ankle is important, but don't forget to do a progressive loading for the for the, the tendon itself. But don't forget the kinetic chain because uh, the hip in, in this specific case is a very important link of the chain too. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on your study. That's very exciting. Uh, and is I think that's great, this broader view that you have about the, the, the connections and the lower body in... We don't know, I don't know what really, what is the cause and what perpetuates the symptoms uh, in relation to that stiff knee. Because I remember when I was talking to Jill, she mentioned that as a differential diagnosis factor between the patellofemoral pain and the tendinopathy, that she said that people that have patellar tendinopathy, they jump with a stiff knee. So I, I, I memorized that. I, I, uh, internalized that. I was like, well, now I was reading your studies and you also said that the, the, the knee is stiff. And I was like, could that be what causes the hip muscles to be weaker? Or maybe because the muscles are weak, they develop that landing. So I was just curious to ask you um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, we don't know. That's the that's the million dollar question I would say because uh, as soon as we find out what causes what we're we would be better at actually addressing the problem. Uh, we we don't know if the weakness in the hip is what causes the abnormal landing mechanics or if because they're landing always using a more stiff mechanics that's why they develop weakness in their in their knee in their in their hips. We don't know if it's because they have pain in the knee, they have inhibition of the muscles in general, of the lower limb. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not sure mm -hmm. what's happening, but regardless of what caused what, we know that that's a factor that should be taken into consideration because even if that wasn't the cause of the problem, it's definitely contributing to uh, a less than ideal distribution of forces uh, around the joints. So that's definitely something to be considered in the rehabilitation. Absolutely. And I mentioned Ebony, and I remember when Ebony mentioned about the patellofemoral pain, 
that she was talking about the hip, to look at the hip and all of that. But I don't recall what she was talking about the tendinopathy. So you are bringing one more piece to the puzzle so we can start thinking about that as well. Yeah, that's that's a great point. For so for I, I want people to be careful about also blaming the glutes for everything. I, I think that that's uh, something that was a bad trend a few years ago. So people started saying that uh, weak glutes were the cause of all the knee pain, uh, ankle sprains, back pain, and whatever. So just be mindful that the glutes are important muscles. They're one of the biggest muscle groups that we have in the body. And we're not making a, an esoteric connection of the kinetic chain. We're not saying that somebody bumped their toe in this chair and then because of that, the tibia, the fibula was misplaced and then they had tension in the hamstrings and then that misplaced the pelvis and that, that causes shoulder pain. We're not talking about this uh, esoteric connection between the, the link. We're, we're talking about pure physics. If you look at biomechanics when you land you have a you have to deal with the ground reaction force and you have big muscle groups that have to dissipate that load if they're not working well you're going to have overload in one of the specific joints so just be mindful of being careful of not overemphasizing one factor not saying that you're gonna you're going to strengthen the hips and you're going to fix every problem in the knee that's not what we're talking about at all but don't forget that that might be one important factor that you should be looking yeah absolutely and then do you address that on the program you do like strengthening of the the external rotators and the extensors and abductors yeah so what we do is we address these factors early on that's one of the beautiful things about that because if you understand which muscles are important for the athlete to perform a job to develop their specific sports specific a task, you know what you need to strengthen for them to get back to full performance. And when their knee is hurting a lot, you can't do much in terms of loading for the knee. You do some isometrics, you do some heavy, slow uh, resistance with a smaller load in the beginning, but you can give a lot of emphasis to factors that are non-local. So uh, we, we give in, in stage one of re rehabilitation. I do a lot of emphasis. I give a lot of emphasis to the hip muscles, to the ankle, to improving the mobility of dorsiflexion, to teaching them about doing an optimal landing mechanics to dissipate the load across all joints. So that way we reduce the overload in the knee in the initial stage, giving a lot of emphasis to these other factors while the knee is settling down or the, while, while the pain decreases. And then in the stage two of rehab, we give a lot of emphasis to progressive loading in the tendon itself. But I, I use a lot of the time in my initial stages of rehab to those kinetic chain factors so that I can have a better progression later on. And I remember reading somewhere on some of your papers that um, you were connecting, you tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but you were connecting as, if I recall correctly, the external rotators and the abductors on the hip, if you have them weak, you would end up putting more load on the medial part of the patellar tendon. Is that right? Yeah, so so, so that's, the, that's the theory because uh, when we look into imaging studies, we find that uh, the patellar tendon more often so, uh, su suffers from tendinopathy in the medial side. If you look into ultrasound studies and uh, magnetic, uh, MRI studies, you would see that the medial part of the tendon is most often affected by tendinopathy. And we don't exactly know the reason why that happens, but one of the reasons might be because when if you land with an excessive knee uh, medial projection, the excessive valgus of the knee when you land, you would have uh, a greater tension in the medial structures of the knee in relation to the lateral structures. So that may be one of the reasons why that happens. So I would definitely look into the landing mechanics of my athlete. If he has excessive knee valgus, I would definitely address that if he has pain. When we look into asymptomatic people, I wouldn't think about changing their landing mechanics. But if somebody comes to me with pain, they have pain in the tendon, and the pain is in the medial side, and I look into their hip extensors, hip abductors, they are weak in relation to what we know from the literature, I would definitely give uh, emphasis to that in my treatment too. And then do you think that that would help, would help to stabilize the knee when you're landing if you have that muscles is stronger on your hip? It would not let put that overload on the medial part of the knee. 
exactly. That's that's right. That that's the the rationale behind that that uh, treatment. Okay, and I know that there is an explanation for hip extensors as well when you're landing. So, like, I know the amount of uh, trunk flexion and how the extensors can control that as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, maybe they don't do trunk flexion when they land because they have weak glutes. That one, that's one of the reasons why they might not. They have, they might have a stiff landing mechanics. That's something that we we consider because when you land and you do more trunk flexion, you have to have strong glutes to hold, to, to control the landing in, in more trunk flexion. Otherwise, you would fall forward. So if people have a weak glute, they won't have that much control when they land. So they would immediately put their trunk in a more extended position so they don't have to control the landing so much. So we, we look into the strength of the hips. If the hips are weak, we're going to address that. And then we're going to increase a little bit the trunk flexion when they land too. I, I can talk a little bit more about that later, but our emphasis would be here to try to decrease the excessive load that would be placed in the patellar tendon when they're landing because uh, the literature shows that if you land with a very upright trunk position, you're going to use your knee more to dissipate the load. You're further away from the center. Uh, your center of mass is further away from the axis of rotation of the knee. So if you Remember the biomechanics, the further away your center of mass is from the axis of the joint, the more the joint has to do force to dissipate the load. The torque is higher at the joint. So if you do a little bit more trunk flexion, you have less load in your patellar tendon. That's something we found in one of the studies from my PhD. So uh, this is also a factor that we have to consider. When you look at the landing mechanics, you see if they're landing in a stiffer uh, strategy, if that's happening. That's also something that we should look for uh, in terms of treatment. Okay, so let's jump to the trend position during the jump landings. So you just talk a little bit how that interferes with the forces on the patellar tendon. So how do you do to address those things? Like, do you practice the landing? So do you work on the strengthening and then you practice the landing? How do you approach the, the landing? What strategy do you use to improve that and reduce that? potential load on the patellar tendon? Sure. So uh, one one study that we did in Australia when I was there uh, in my PhD, we were looking into uh, Olympic level athletes. We were asking them to jump, landing with their self-selected position. Then we changed the position. We asked them to land with a little bit more trunk flexion and then land with a little bit more trunk extension, land with the trunk as upright as possible. And what we found was that when they land with a little bit more trunk flexion, you have a significant decrease in the patellar tendon load, about 6%, 7%, uh, which gives us about one time your body weight. So that's a very uh, significant reduction in your load in the tendon. And also they had a reduction in their pain. People with patellar tendinopathy that would land with a little bit more trunk flexion had less knee pain during landing than when they landed with their trunk upright, with their trunk in extension. So that immediately got us thinking that if you change the landing mechanics, especially in the initial stages, when they have a very symptomatic knee, you would decrease the loads in the tendon uh, during their sports participation. And then progressively, you can go back into a more extended position. But in the initial stage, it's important to try to settle down the tendon that's very symptomatic. So that's something that we try to address now. So back to your question, how do we how do we do that? How do we approach the landing mechanics? What we do is uh, we ask. Well, first, we start strengthening the hips. In the very initial stage in our clinical trial that we're doing here, we do strengthening of the hip, uh, isolated strengthening of the hip. We prefer the single limb deadlift exercise because that's an exercise that has been shown in this in the literature to be the, one of the exercises that has more activation of the gluteus maximus, has the biggest activation of that muscle. So we emphasize that with load, with progressive load. We also do isolated hip extension because we want to focus on that specific muscle. And then we uh, try to train them in their landing mechanics. So first we start with a simple drop jump. So they are landing from a box around 30 centimeters in, uh, in height. We ask them to land 
and do a little bit of trunk flexion and do a backward projection of their hips. So just to be clear, we don't ask them to land and then do this, just hand their trunk forward. We ask them to project their hips back and just do a little bit more trunk flexion. And then we ask them to pay attention to the sound of their landing. If they're landing and making a lot of noise, that's usually an indicator that they're landing stiffly. So we ask, pay attention to the sound, land as softly as possible. Try to make no sound whatsoever. And then they, they really pay attention into using their ankles, using their hips, using their knees, bending their trunk a little bit more. So they actually do a better distribution of the load across all joints. And then as soon as they do well with the drop landing, which is a simple, just drop from the bench, the drop from the box and land, we ask them to do more dynamic activities. So after a drop jump, we do a drop vertical jump. So they land from the box and then do a maximal vertical jump and then land again. And then I ask them to pay attention in both landings, land as soft as possible, a little bit of backward projection of your hips, a little bit more trunk flexion. And then as soon as that is doing well, we progress to more sports specific jumps. So we go into, if it's a volleyball player, I'm going to ask him to do a, a, te- a serve and then land as softly as possible. I'm going to ask him to come and do an attack and then land as softly as possible. One challenge that we, we face when we, when we do that is the net because the volleyball player is going to attack and then he can't hit the net because if he does strong flexion, he's going to hit the net. So what do we do? We ask them to turn sideways a little bit. And I can show you several videos of how we do that. He comes, he comes running, he does the attack, and then instead of landing facing forward, they turn to the side and then they're able to do a soft landing, more trunk flexion, less emphasis on the knee when he's landing, more emphasis in distributing the load in the joints. So we, we've been very successful at actually teaching them how to do that. They, they, they find that that's kind of challenging in the beginning, but after a few repetitions, they see that that's not too hard to accomplish. And then they take that strategy right away. It's crazy how everything is so theoretical. And then when you go to like your day to day, you are there um, rehabbing an athlete or doing some prevention programs. And then you have to adapt that to their sport specific techniques. So that's, that's so interesting when you mentioned that. It was like, man, you're just here talking about all this theory. And then when you go to the day-to-day practice, how you have to just get the concept and find a way to apply because it's not as simple, okay, just land doing that. When you're doing a serve or you're attacking and you are in like an intense sport activity, you have to take into consideration all these factors that play on how you position yourself, your body mechanics, and how what do you have to do to be able to successfully implement those things. So that was very interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very, very important to keep in mind because one thing is a control laboratory setting where everything is simple or more simple, it's more uh, control. And when you go into a chaotic condition of a game where you have to land, you have to grab, you have to grab the ball, you have to hit the ball, that's, that's very different. That's why you have to train until that becomes automatic. They, they can't be thinking about doing that. They have to train so much that it, they actually do that without thinking. And uh, we, we're actually being able to implement that in the final stages too because we go with them to their, their, uh, their sports setting and then we ask, ask them to do that intensely. We, we work with the coaches too so that the coaches understand what we're asking them to do. They see that that's not something that's going to interfere with their uh, their sports uh, performance, and then they're they're on board with us. But one thing that I would like to mention is, if you if you think about how much times you land, how much times you jump during a week, there are some studies showing that elite volleyball athletes jump around six hundred times. You, that's that's an insane number of jumps in a week, and. Even though you're not going to do that in every single jump, because sometimes you have to land stiff, you have to do, do a, a quick rebound, you have to jump right away to get the ball. There's no way you're going to land softly every time. But when you're doing a serve, there's nothing there. there there's no reason why you shouldn't land softly. After you've done a su- successful layup in basketball, you already got the ball in. There's no reason why you couldn't land softly to try to minimize the load in those situations. So. 
that's why we try that's what we try to implement it's not mm-hmm. going to happen every time but if you reduce let's say 10 percent, 15 percent of the times you land you land better you land more softly that may be the reason why you don't have symptoms in the long term absolutely um and you just gotta repeat and repeat and repeat until you get it yeah um uh, and so let's talk now to the about the darcy flexion other factor that we know that plays into the whole picture. So how can ankle dorsiflexion restriction result in overload on the patellar tendon? Yeah, that's that's very interesting too, because uh, one thing that we found in one of my PhD studies too was that people that had patellar tendinopathy had a more common history of ankle sprains. So we looked into the control group. They had very few ankle sprains. One or two people had a history of ankle sprains. When we looked into the people with patellar tendinopathy, the majority of them, a lot of them had at least a history of one injury in the ankle prior to having patellar tendinopathy. So that, that, that got us thinking maybe the previous history of injury is something that can increase the chance for you to develop patellar tendinopathy. And we found a study that actually saw that. Uh, the study was published in 2011 at the American Journal of Sports Medicine from Backman and Danielson. And what they found was that people that had a history of ankle sprain had more uh, dorsiflexion restriction after the, the, the injury. And because they had dorsiflexion restriction, uh, they had an abnormal mechanics of their landing, and that potentially caused their patellar tendinopathy. So what we started looking into was what happens when you have a dorsiflexion restriction, what what does that impact the kinetic chain? What happens? And we we found a systematic review that was published in 2017. And what they say there is that if you have a restricted dorsiflexion range of motion, you have an abnormal landing mechanics because you have less knee flexion and ha- less hip flexion when you land. And that's kind of obvious. If you don't have dorsiflexion, if your movement is restricted in the lower link chain you can't move your tibia forward so you're not going to do knee flexion and you can't if you can't do knee flexion you're not going to do hip flexion as well and they also found that when you have a dorsiflexion restriction you have a landing with a higher ground reaction force and that also makes sense because if you're not dissipating the load in form of movement if you're not doing dorsiflexion you're not doing knee flexion you're not doing hip flexion you're going to have a higher ground reaction force and that force has to go somewhere. So where does that force go? It, you, you will go into your passive tissues, you will go into your tendons, you will go into your cartilage. So they uh, suggest that the dorsiflexion restriction is an important factor that may cause injuries in your knee, in your hips, even up in the kinetic chain. So as soon as we saw that, we started paying more attention to the kinetic chain in terms of how dorsiflexion will interfere with everything else. So my key uh, message here would be, if your patient has a history of ankle sprains, pay attention to their dorsiflexion. Pay attention to that. If they have a a dorsiflexion restriction, even if they don't have a history of ankle sprain, assess their dorsiflexion range of motion, because if that's restricted, you're not going to have the normal mechanics that you would have before, that you had before the injury. So... Uh, one of one of the things that we saw was that if you have a restriction in dorsiflexion, your ankle plantar flexors are not going to be as effective at producing the eccentric contractions that they need to dissipate the load. So there, uh, if you look into studies into the contribution of the different joints for force dissipation, you will see that approximately 40% of the, the force is dissipated at the ankle. So if 40% of the force should be dissipated down there, and because the ankle is stiff, it's not moving well, you have a restriction there, you have less dissipation at the, at the ankle, somewhere over in the kinetic chain is going to have to do more work to dissipate that, dissipate that load. So I would be very mindful of looking into dorsiflexion, looking at what tissue is actually restricting the movement. So yeah, when, I, when I talk about that, uh, what I mean is, you may have a restriction because your soleus is shortened. You have a tightness in the muscle, and that's why you have a dorsiflexion restriction. But you also may have a, a dorsiflexion restriction because your joint is stiff. So if, you're, if your arthrokinematics is not normal, if your talus is not moving back in the ankle mortis the way that it should, uh, 
you're going to have a limitation in the dorsiflexion because of a uh, joint issue, not because of, because of a muscle uh, shortness. So what you should do is you should do my manual therapy for, for the joint. You should do mobilizations. I really like mobilizations with movement from Brian Mulligan to improve that dorsiflexion so that they can land using their ankles at their fall potential. Does that make sense? Yes, everything makes perfect sense. And it seems so obvious when you say it's like, yes, of course, if they don't have dorsiflexion, it makes perfect sense. But sometimes you just forget to see those things when you are treating because sometimes we fail to see the big picture and you just focus on the knee, on the knee strengthening and forget to look at these other pieces that pay, play a big role in all of the, the chain, as you mentioned. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and so how are the results from everything, like all those different things that you've been seeing and studying? So how do you, how are these results on your research when you start addressing those things? Because I remember you saw one of like, I think it was like volleyball that you compare, like you observed the first year and then on the second year, you implemented all those, um, all those things into their uh, practice. And so how is, in your experience, the results when you start addressing those factors that we just mentioned? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a study that I'm very proud of too. We did a collaboration study with my good friend Natalia Bittencourt from uh, Minas Gerais. It's a state in the southeast of Brazil. She works with uh, very high level uh, volleyball athletes and they, they were having a lot of tendinopathy in their, in, in their seasons of uh, com competition. So she had the idea of doing a preventive study to see what would happen if we did, did an intervention addressing these factors. So we came up with an intervention that would try to address all of the kinetic chain factors for them to implement in their uh, warm-up. So we did, uh, we first of all, in the first year, we measured their uh, incidence of patellar tendinopathy. We did no intervention. We asked them to just do the warm-up as usual. And then in the second year, we uh, addressed each athlete individually with a pragmatic uh, study in, t in terms of we would only address the things that we found in their assessment. So we did a, a, a pre-competition, pre-season uh, assessment of everybody. And then we found out that this, per this person has dorsiflexion restriction. This person has weakness in their hip extensors. This person has a stiff landing mechanics. This person has everything, has all these factors. This guy doesn't have any factor, but he has been training too much. He just increased their training load too much. So we started seeing that we're, you're not going to see everything in the same person, but maybe one of the factors alone doesn't do much. But if you have several factors in the same person and you put the increased training load in the equation, then you have an over, overload issue. So what we started doing was we implemented some strategies for improving dorsiflexion in their warm-up, hip extensor strengthening in their warm-up, activation of the muscles, landing mechanics, looking into the, how they could uh, address that in, the, in their warm-up. And the warm-up was very short. It was a short intervention, just trying to address exactly what we found in the assessments. And then we followed them up for a whole, no, a whole another season. And what we found was that there was a 51% decrease in the incidence of patellar tendinopathy in the second season in relation to the first season. And those results are very, it's, it's very promising. It's, it's still, a, it's just a cohort. Of course, we need a randomized control trial to confirm that we need a larger study, but that got us really excited because we may be onto something in terms of prevention for a population that suffers a lot from that condition. Yeah, that's amazing. 51% is a big reduction. Yeah. And I saw another study that you were doing to compare this low res, uh, heavy resistance training with the oh, with those other factors that we just mentioned have you completed that study or is that in the in, in progress no that's still in progress so that's also something i'm very much looking forward to seeing the results so this is a study from a, a phd student of mine eduardo araujo he's doing a clinical trial comparing two interventions so one group receives 
the heavy slow resistance training, which is a progressive loading, loading uh, program that's very popular for tendinopathy. is one of the best interventions in terms of progressive loading that we have. So uh, he, the, one group does that, and the other group is doing what we call the kinetic chain intervention, which is we do an exercise for the quadriceps as well because we want to give the tendon progressive load, but we also do a, a progressive training for the hip extensors, progressive training for their ankle plantar flexors. We address dorsiflexion restriction. We address their landing mechanics, and we're going to compare the results in the short term immediately after the intervention and six months after the intervention to see if their strength changes, if their function changes, if their landing mechanics changes, and most importantly, if their symptom severity changes in terms of uh, results. So that's that's what we're doing right now. I, I still can't give you any any uh, spoilers on the, those results because the clinical trial is still ongoing. We have, I think, 15, 16 patients uh, enrolled. They're, uh, they're doing the intervention right now, so I, I can't give you any, any results, but I'm looking forward to being able to disseminate those results as soon as we have them. I'm curious to see what's going to happen because I understood that you're just adding those to the 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 same progression, the same heavy slow resistance training, progressively putting adding load to the tendon, and then you are adding those act other factors that we just discussed, right? It's kind of like an addition to the what the slow resistance training is. Just correct me here if I'm off. So it's not exactly an, an addition because we, we changed a little bit. Uh, the heavy slow resistance program has three exercises. So, so for those who are home and don't know that, you have the, the leg press, you do the hex squats, and you do the, uh, the, 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 the squat with the bar on your back, the, the back squat. So you have three exercises for the quadriceps. Uh, you do that progressively. You, you start with 15 repetition maximum, and then you go progressively up until you get to six repetition maximum. And you do that for 12 weeks. So three exercises, emphasis on the quadriceps, progressive load to the tendon. Mm -hmm. What we did was we didn't do the three exercises. We we got uh, we got rid of the leg press. We got rid of the hex squat. We we only did the back squat for the kinetic chain group. Because we're, we're not sure you need three exercises for the quadriceps. I don't, I don't think we need the three. Maybe just one is enough. But we're one, one intervention is quadriceps progressive load with the back squat. But we're adding the hip strengthening. We're adding the uh, soleus strengthening and the dorsiflexion and the landing mechanics. And the reason why we did that is because we didn't want to have an intervention that would be too, lo too much more time, much longer than the other. If we added a lot of things to this intervention, we wouldn't know if the patient would get better because we're doing a lot more things or because we're addressing the kinetic chain factor. So that's why we shifted things a little bit. Yeah, makes sense. Well, come back to let us know when the results are up. <laughs> uh, and another thing that I wanted to ask you is how the weakness in the lower extremity and trunk muscles can favor the development of tendinopathies in the upper extremity, extremity in, for example, throwing athletes. So we know we have a lot of connections. So how do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I don't think we have a, an answer for that yet. But uh, if you look into the literature, you have a lot of emphasis being given in the last few years on the importance of the kinetic chain for the development of some injuries in the upper extremity. Uh, I don't think we have enough prospective studies yet to actually uh, affirm that you have a, a direct connection, you have a direct risk factor. If you don't have enough strength in your trunk rotators, you're going to develop a tendinopathy in your shoulder, in your elbow. But I, I do think that that makes a lot of sense because if you look into the connection of the joints, if you look into how a professional athlete performs a throw in relation to somebody who's a complete amateur, you're going to see a big difference in the mechanics of the body. Uh, I always give the, my students examples using boxing because I, I, I practice martial arts. If I don't give them a boxing or a martial art references, it's, something is wrong in my class. So what we do, uh, when, I, when I give the example of a punch in boxing, if you look at somebody who's an, uh, 
professional boxing uh, athlete doing a, a cross punch, you will see him doing the punch using his whole body. You're going to see that the punch starts at the, at the ground. He pushes the ground with his back back leg. Then he extends the knee. He extends the hip. He rotates the trunk, and then he develops a really powerful punch. Whereas if you if you ask a complete amateur, somebody in the street, give me a punch, punch this punching bag, you're going to see the person walk to the bag and just do this. They're just going to use their, their arm, their, their, right? extend, extend their knee, their elbow, and punch the, the, the bag. And then you see a, a, a massive difference in the power, in the performance. But when you look into what is going on in the joints, you're going to see that they're using only their elbows and, the, and their shoulders to, to develop that power. So what I think makes a lot of sense is if you have a professional athlete who has had an injury in their, in their lower extremity, they have had, uh, I don't know, a knee injury, a hip injury, they have had back pain, there's a chance that they have weakness in those muscles. And then there's a chance that when they're doing the same punch that they are used to doing, they're not using their kinetic chain as well as they used to do. So uh, I, I definitely look into that because there are there's one study that's very famous that actually measured how much load you, you have in the different joints, how much you use the different joints to perform a tennis serve. And what they found that is that 54% of the, of the force that is generated during a tennis serve comes from the trunk and the lower limbs. It's a very substantial amount of load, uh, amount of force that is coming from the lower limbs, the trunk rotation to actually perform that activity. So if you have a restriction on that, the load is not being well transmitted, the force in the trunk is somehow decreased, you're going to have to use your shoulders more, your elbow more to generate the same force. So that makes perfect sense to me. I just, I want people to be mindful of the kinetic chain, but don't be overemphasizing the kinetic chain in your treatment too. Don't think you're going to treat all your patients doing kinetic chain strengthening. But of course, for some patients, when you assess them, you see the importance of the kinetic chain during his sports performance. And then you see that there's a break in the link. Some For some reason, the, the, the transmission of force is not ideal. You should address that. And that's not just for athletes too. If you, if you take... Mrs. Johnson, 70-year-old uh, sedentary patient that is not using her trunk when she's lifting something, she's just using her arms, she's going to have an overload in her, in her, in her shoulder. So if you teach her how to use her whole body mechanics to generate force, you can also improve that patient's quality of life too. Yeah, I think you just be mindful of everything that plays into that movement. And like as you said, the tennis herb, that was... It was a little surprising that you use that much lower extremity and trunk. So sometimes I guess these things, we just don't pay as much attention to it as we should. And those things can have an important role in injuries and, and mainly in like professional athletes that they need everything that they have to be efficient and prevent injuries. So that was very interesting. Um, Rodrigo, before we transition to the final questions, anything else that you want to say or mention before we wrap up this topic? I think my main message would be uh, consider that musculoskeletal injuries are multifactorial. Don't forget that you have several causes usually for an overuse injury. So unless you're dealing with a fracture, a, a traumatic injury, that you have a very specific point, you know exactly what caused the injury. You should be doing a thorough assessment of your patients, looking into the, their performance of their sports, looking into their performance of their functional everyday activities, their hobbies. And if you find that they're not using their body as, as well as they could, if they're not performing well with their whole body mechanics to actually perform that well, consider that the kinetic chain as one factor that should be addressed in your, in your treatment. But don't forget to load the tissues that are actually being uh, symptomatic. Because when I talk about this, people sometimes take away the message that the glutes are the, the culprit. The, the reason why my patient has tendinopathy is because they have a restriction in dorsiflexion. So don't, don't be uh, obsessive with those factors, but also be mindful of them. Don't, don't neglect them completely. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, Rodrigo, what is your favorite resource of information? Is there anything in particular that you like? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I usually uh, like to read papers from my favorite journals. That's my main my main source of information. So I have a reminder in my email that as soon as the JOSPT articles are published, I have a notification so I can see what's new. I immediately go to the journal. I download the most important articles and I, I take the time to read them to always stay up to date. I do PubMed searches often on the topics that I search and then that, that I research the most. And uh, I also tend to look at the quality of the study before I start reading because I, I, try, uh, I try to keep in mind that if the methods of the results are bad, the results don't matter. We have a lot of really bad research, uh, research uh, being published all over. And uh, if you if you read everything and you just try to implement everything, you, you're going to be very confused. But if you really take the time to see if the evidence is of good quality before you start reading, you have a better chance of treating your patients better, of actually reading things that matter and optimizing your time. I also like podcasts in general. I, li I really like the BJSM podcasts. The British Journal of Sports Medicine has great podcasts with specialists in the field of uh, sports injuries. I really like the JOSPT podcast. It's very good. They, they do short interviews with experts, people talking about their publications. So it's, it's a great way to stay up to date if you're, if you're very busy in your everyday life. Put your ear your earplugs uh, your earphones on, and when you're doing the dishes, you're updating yourself. That's a great way to stay up to date with the literature. Yeah, that's what I do too. Yeah. Uh, and what would be the best advice that you give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, well. I really think it's important for uh, young clinicians to keep in mind that uh, it's okay for you to make mistakes in the beginning. It's it's expected that you, you are going to make a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but you should be striving to get better every day. You should be striving to get better. And the way to get better, in my opinion, is you should be evidence-based. You should And being evidence-based means you're looking for the best available evidence. You're practicing a lot what you're doing and you're respectful of the patient's wishes and preferences. So you're, you're not imposing your treatment. It's not, uh, it's not because you, you, made a manual, you, you got a manual therapy course in the weekend that you're going to use manual therapy with everybody. There are patients that don't like to be touched. There are patients that don't respond well to manual therapy. So being evidence-based means you should have the three things. You should look for the best available evidence. You should practice. You should know how to implement that intervention. And you should be respectful of the patient's wishes and preferences. That's that's one one of the things that are more most important. But also be empathetic with your patient. Feel feel their pain. Know that you're you're privileged to work in a profession that uh, you you get paid to take the pay, the patient's pain away. You get paid to help people get back to doing the things that they love the most. So I think it's a privilege. So really. Take the time to enjoy that, to uh, not take that for granted because it's an amazing professional. Yeah. I think you just answered my last question. That is what personal qualities and abilities are important to be a successful PT. So you said being empathetic, that's one. Anything else that you want to add to this one? Yeah, I think most of the things that I said, uh, I think it's very important for you to be on time. Uh, be punctual. Be respectful of the everybody's time. Don't don't be late. Be uh, evidence-based because that's where you make less mistakes you have the shoulder of giants to stand on uh, look into the literature look into what's being published in the best journals do your research that way you're going to make less mistakes and be empathetic really consider the patient the most important person in the room uh, listen to them because they're trying to tell them what's wrong with them don't don't be arrogant be humble and uh, try to figure out a way to help your patient in the best possible way. Yeah, absolutely. Rodrigo, if anyone wants to learn more about you, your studies, or contact you, is there a way they can find you? Sure. So um, I'm mostly active on Instagram, but I post a lot in Portuguese because we're trying to do knowledge translation here in Brazil. So 
find me there, you're going to see a lot of Portuguese. So it's your opportunity to learn Portuguese too. <laughs> but I would say I'm also on Twitter. So at Scatoni Silva, which is my last name. If you look for Rodrigo Scatoni, you, you'll find me easily. And uh, I every time we publish something new, I always make sure to, to post, to try to disseminate the knowledge that we're producing in academia because one of the, my lines of research is also focusing on knowledge translation. We're, uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between clinical practice and uh, research. So clinicians have access to what's being produced in the university. So whenever we publish something, we make an infographic and we disseminate that in the clinical, in the social media too. That's very cool. And I had a lot of Brazilians asking me to, to do like a translation in Portuguese of the, <laughs> the episodes. So Portuguese is it's easy, people. Let's go learn. <laughs> not very easy. Not at all. I think it's harder than English. Um, but yeah, so Rodrigo, thank you so much for taking the time and come share your knowledge with us. I'm very happy uh, to have you here and bringing attention to all those different factors that I think are very important. And sometimes we just don't think about it. So Thank you so much for your work, your research, and for bringing these topics up here for, for our discussion. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, I was honored to be here after so many people that I respect and admire. So thank you. Thank you.